So what is deja vu? Can you describe deja vu? In the co coming moments, I am going to sound like a broken record. Uh, I'm going to do what I tend to do and what uh, many of my uh, clergy colleagues seem to do. I'm going to make you feel like I'm beating a dead horse. Uh, can you think of an example of deja vu? I'm going to sound like a broken record in the coming moments, uh, and I'm going to sound like I'm beating a dead horse. Okay, so what is deja vu? Can you describe deja vu? In the co coming moments, I am going to sound like a broken record. Uh, I'm going to do what I tend to do and what uh, many of my uh, clergy colleagues seem to do. I'm going to make you feel like I'm beating a dead horse. Uh, can you think of an example of deja vu? I'm going to sound like a broken record in the coming moments uh, and I'm going to sound like I'm beating a dead horse. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Preparing for Sunday, where you and I take a look together at the upcoming Sunday's scripture uh, based on the lectionary uh, text uh, for uh, the Sunday ahead. Uh, so this is for Sunday, November 10th, uh, 2024. We are to Pentecost plus 25, the 25th week after Pentecost, year B, so we continue to be in Mark. And uh, the last couple of weeks have had some special designations. We've had Reformation Sunday. Uh, we've had All Saints Sunday. I stayed with the lectionary. And now that sort of pays off because we'll continue in the story of Mark instead of leaping around for the day. Um, uh, so the text for this week is Mark 12, 38 through 44. And uh, I have six things to talk to you about this text in particular, six things that I made note of. The first one is that deja vu piece. The first one is that broken record that Pastor John beating a bit of a dead horse here. Uh, but what is uh, the parable of the sower? Do you remember the parable of the sower? Uh, can you, uh, at this point, uh, tell me where that is found in, in Mark's story? Uh, that's Mark 4, 1 through 9, right? And do you remember, it's the story, it's a story, it's the parable of a person, a farmer, sowing seed, and he's a terrible farmer because he has so much seed, he doesn't care where it goes, he just sows it all over the place, it's, it's willy-nilly, it's wanton, he's just throwing this gospel of seed everywhere. Do you remember the places where it lands? Can you list those places? Um, one is that it lands on, on hard ground and the birds come and eat it up, right? And then there's the, the rocky ground that has a little bit of soil, takes root, but the sun comes up, scorches it, kills the, the plant that's grown, right? Uh, the next one is that it's, it's the thrown, it's sown in a place where it competes with thorns and the thorns choke it out. They compete with the actual plant and uh, the, the thorns uh, sort of overcome the actual plant. And then the final thing is good soil. Did you remember all those? Because I'm a broken record with this because Mark is uh, uh, a story. Mark is uh, really good at telling a story. And one of the things that Mark did very early is give us the parable of the sower, which just about every other thing that's happening in the gospel of Mark fits. So I always recap that, and I've done it so many times now, you probably have it memorized. It's, it's Mark 4, 1 through 9, it's the parable of the sower. Because in today's text, we're going to get the comparison of what it looks like when people are the seed that is competing with thorns and losing, and when we're good soil. We're going to get those two things set right next to each other. And this is the uh, sort of literary device that Mark has used, and that parable's a big deal. So a uh, broken record on that one, but I wanted to rehash, relook at, and rethink about the parable of the sower. So that's one thing. The second thing is also deja vu. This is also a reminder, this is also a recap from a thing that I just talked to you about last week. And my sense is, uh, you know, I, I've, I've studied the Bible uh, in depth and sort of academically and read and, and spent a lot of time with the Bible and stories about the Bible for many years now. 
And what I've learned is, is that all out of it is the same, you're looking at the same stuff over and over again. And you're always sort of remembering and hearing new things in it. And uh, that's what scripture is. Uh, so last week I talked about the idea that where we are in Mark is this place of rising action. Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. And the way Mark's story is, is that Jesus is what I'll call a sort of rural guy. He's, he's a rural guy made, made out for the big city. You know, it's that story technique of a guy who's from uh, um, out in the middle of nowhere who has big dreams and is going to go to the city. Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. Uh, he's been talking to his disciples. Crowds at times have gathered around him. His face is now set to Jerusalem. In Mark 12, we get this rising action. And one of the big things, and this is what I talked about last week, in that rising action is increasing uh, difficulty with the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. Now, I'm not going to do this here, but those three groups represent three uh, sort of different, but the same kinds of thinking. So they're different in that the particulars of what they believe are, are tweaked. They, they don't all believe the same things. They don't always, the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees are not the same people. They do not always get along. Uh, they don't always agree on every question. However, uh, they are the same in that they're all sort of part of the system. They're like politicians. If, if the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees are all sort of different parties, uh, they are all in the same system. And so uh, they, they operate a lot the same way. They just answer the questions differently. And we're in this section of rising action, and this is where we are. And incidentally, with Jesus, with his face set to Jerusalem, with this talk of politicians who answer the same questions, but always just a little bit different because they're a politician, that's a recap of the week that was, right? I mean, this was election week, and so you get a lot of flavoring of uh, human uh, governance and civic stuff that is, is timeless in a lot of ways. And so in this rising action, you get the device Mark uses in the story now, the parable of the sower is this uh, thesis statement for how the whole book looks. Um, someone is either going to, is going to be one of the types of soil at every step. And we keep that in mind. But in this rising action, the, the thing that Mark adds in is Jesus' face is set to Jerusalem and he's coming more and more in contact with the powers that be. It's like you're heading to Columbus at the State House, or you're heading to Washington, D.C. And so the politics and civic things are more to the forefront as Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And, and, and Mark depicts this with this rising action of a series of tests and questions, and then Jesus answers and interactions. So um, that's, that's the thing I talked somewhat about last week because we were in Mark 12 last week too. And Mark 12 has made up a lot of this rising action of coming more and more in contact with the powers who be and the literary devices, a scribe, a Pharisee, a Sadducee, often a scribe in Mark, comes to Jesus and asks a question to test him or, or put him on the spot. What, what the scribe is doing by asking that question is politicizing Jesus. Jesus is building these crowds because Jesus is about love and care and uh, nurture and, and and being God's grace for people no matter what situation they're in. The scribe, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, they live in a world where it's really, and theologians do this too. So people like me who beat dead horses for a living uh, do this too, incidentally. But, but the, they're about splitting the hairs of things. And they know that by asking these questions, they're likely to make it more about the question than the reality of the grace. They know that by um, asking a question on a hot topic like, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, who, resurrection, not all the parties believe the same thing. In Jesus' world, the religious people are the political people. The political people are the religious people. It's kind of it's kind of intermingled. Uh, to some degree, we have that with what I would call evangelicals in America to sort of great harm, and it's the great harm in the Bible. And um, when they ask these questions. They have Jesus, who is God himself, who's come to bring love and grace. And instead of getting into that love or grace, they're asking questions because it's a political endeavor to break down his following. 
It's to try to get people who follow him to be like, well, you know, I don't believe the way that he answered that question. Yeah, I mean, he's been really loving. He healed me. But uh, what he says about the resurrection is not how I see it, so I'm going to go back home. You know, they're, they're trying to label him, to, 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 to put him in a box, and to also limit the amount of people that are following him. That's, that's sort of the, the political action of this. And, and the way that, that Mark tells that story is now Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. He's swimming in with the big political religious dogs now. And, and they are going to keep putting him on the test, with the, putting him to the test with these great questions that they have, that they get divided and stuck in. All those uh, commercials we've been watching on TV that get these politicians of ours who are super smart, super gifted, super pedigreed people, but they get locked into sort of stuff sometimes that it's just like, whoa, that's not a thing you know, that, we're, that we're worried about. And so we get this in 11, 27 through 33, we get the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, trying to box Jesus in, trying to break down his following, trying to politicize him. We get that in 12, uh, 13 through 17. We get that in 12, 18 through 27. We get that in 12, 28 through 34. And then we get that in 12, 35 through 37. This rising action of, of ma trying to make political who Jesus is, all right? So the parable of the sower, the rising action, these are things that, that it's good to have in your mind when you start to get to this week's text. Um, because that's, you, 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 what, what sometimes we don't do when we, when we read a story is, is we, we like a story, we hear a story, uh, but we're not always very mindful of, of what the story's doing to us. Mark is triggering some things uh, you know, it's it's a rising action. It's a building story. And so he's having these sort of callbacks to the parable of the sower. He's having these contextual things where, you know, he can he can have Jesus in, in verses 38 through 44 this week speak and tell a story. But it's, it's unpacking all this other stuff that's happened. The parable of the sower, the healings, the crowds, uh, the, the face turned to Jerusalem, uh, the, the people choosing politics instead of grace. You know, it, all that can happen without this text even saying any of those words or doing any of that stuff because the story is building. That's why I did not want to exit from the story for Reformation or for All Saints. That's why I stayed in it because it, it, you start to hopefully hear this sort of compounding thing. And that's the way God's word works. God's word is not a, you got it, you heard it, and, and you have it. It is a constant affirmation of who, who we are, and, and then which causes us to affirm who God is. God speaks to us, and, we, and it happens daily, and it happens in this sort of new voice and timbre, and it happens in this sort of compounding way. The text is doing that. The Bible is a very human centric it's God speaking in our language and so the way the story goes is a lot like the way our life goes and so we have this rising action scribes Pharisees all this is happening here now the third thing I want to point out here in this text is that it actually is not concurrent to last week's last week's was in mark 12 but this week is mark 12 38 through 44 which means it skips verses 35 36 and 37. If you want to see these, you'd have to go back. I always recommend pausing these and reading the text when, I, when I'm talking about it so that you can even, as I talk about other verses and chapters in Mark, you can, you can be like, oh yeah, I'm going to go back and look at that. Mark 12, 35, 36, and 37 is skipped by the lectionary. In it, you get this thing about Messiahship of Jesus. You only sort of say, oh, ding, I see why that's happening here because you get that rising action of Jesus trying to be politicized. Jesus is God's son on earth. You and I cannot comprehend the breadth and the depth of that. Every day is a new reality of how great and powerful and providential and loving and uh, in, in the wall uh, giving God is. I mean, we, we, we can't fathom that in, 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 a mil, in, in an infinity of lifetimes. That's why we're talking about eternal life. God is just this huge thing. And, and Jesus now is, is trying to be approached and sort of earmarked as which political party he is. 
because they're trying to put him in a box where they know how to deal with him and they know how to break down his foot, you know, his followers. They're trying, they're trying this political tactic with him. And so then you get these 35, 36, and 37 where, where his discussion of what it means to be the Messiah and the King of David, son of David, sorry, is, is, is happens just real quick in those verses. That's happening because the question is being put to Jesus more and more, what his politics are. And so he's he's kind of playing with that there in 35 and 36 and 37. The, the um, uh, lectionary skips those, and it skips those, I think, because I, I think it assumes that people don't watch Preparing for Sundays. I think it assumes people don't, don't come to church every Sunday and work their way through the whole story. I think it assumes, maybe it's assuming, hey, this comes right in election season and people have had enough of this. Uh, but, but whatever it assumes, it assumes that, you, that, that, that normal reading in church, if you read this text, people wouldn't understand what's going on with it. It, it assumes that it has way too much context, way too much backstory, and way too much insider language for the common person to understand it. I don't assume that. I think those verses should have been in there. But again, you know, the lectionary and I, the lectionary is bigger than I am. And that's why I use it. Um, I am, you know, in off and on sort of critical of it, and maybe I shouldn't be, but it skips those verses. Maybe it's okay because we're tired of hearing about election stuff. Although, but incidentally, that flavors the sermon because this text is so uh, political, and I'm going to get into the actual text in a minute. Because um, so far, all I've done is beat a dead horse in the background, right? Uh, so uh, it skips those verses because it assumes you don't know the context. It assumes they're too complicated for us to understand. It assumes they're too much for a sermon. And in some ways, they're kind of right. But I would have liked the challenge of it, I think. But uh, there's that. So I talked to you about uh, the parable of the sower. I talked to you about the rising action. And I talked to you about the verses that get skipped. All that is really contextual leading up into these verses itself, all right? So what we get here in Mark 12, 38 through 44, if you're ready, this is the pause point, and you would read those verses, 12, Mark 12, 38 through 44. What we get here are, is, a, are, are, is a discussion of scribes. We get as Jesus characterizing, characterizing scribes. We get Jesus sort of making a point by telling a story about scribes. What's important to understand, I think, you know, read that story, what I think is important to understand is, is this idea of scribes. Mark's story has been jam-filled with scribes. He, he talks about the scribes a lot. Scribes are religious, political uh, people. They are learned. They're uh, kind of like uh, uh, the lawyer -y kind of governance workers, right? So they're, they're smart, they work with words, they're all about semantics, they're all about like I am beating dead horses and, and broken records saying what's the law here? And, and so they've been up against Jesus throughout the Gospel of Mark. I mean that starts all the way back in like, uh, as far back as like chapter 2. It's, it's the scribes keep popping up here or there and they don't always agree. Um, incidentally, I would send you to look at 1234, uh, which is just a few verses back from this week's reading. And you'll see that Jesus says of one of the scribes, you are not far from the kingdom of God, which is for Mark, a complimentary thing for Jesus to say, that you're not far from the kingdom of God is more than he says for the disciples. And so it, although it's adversarial, uh, this relationship, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, God is about grace and, and Jesus is about grace. And so it's not exclusionary adversarialism. It's, it's not to, to get rid of them. Like they're trying to put Jesus in a box to, to dwindle who would agree with him and, and therefore be able to sort of defeat him or, or have power over him. Jesus won't even do that with the scribes who put themselves in a, in a place of, of uh, competition with him. He won't even, he'll, he'll at times say, you're not far from the kingdom of God, even to a scribe. And so what we're getting here, though, is what we're getting in 38 through 44 is not an interaction with an actual scribe. It's a story to the crowds about scribes. The, the, the minutia of that is important to see. He's in this section where he's been being approached by scribes a lot. But the way that this is addressed is it says he's speaking to the crowds. It does not say he's looking at a scribe. So what it, what what Mark is doing 
is having Jesus make a characterization. Uh, now, you know, we have all sorts of characterizations. Uh, I would say sexism, racism, uh, you know, things about people's sexuality, often these are generalizations. Uh, so-and-so is such and such, so that means they drive bad. You know, a certain person is a certain uh, nationality, a certain gender, a certain age, and therefore they drive bad. Well, that's not true. And this is a mistake we fall into all the time. So, you know, the person who cuts you off in traffic is, uh, looks like they are from a certain gender, they're a certain gender, or they're a certain uh, persuasion, or they're a certain race or something. And then we are like, well, this is why I don't like people from that group, because they're all like this. Th that's not true. Um, these generalizations are problematic. And, and I have to address that here because good uh, sort of human psychological development, it challenges oneself to not just generalize somebody because of the group they're in. Just because a person is uh, of a certain race doesn't mean that they are um, uh, to be uh, the, the flagship for the whole race and how they behave exemplifies everybody in that race. That's, that's, that's a problem. And so we, we have to be uh, more thoughtful than that. Uh, as people freed by God to live well, we have to be more thoughtful than that. But as much as I'm saying that, here we are with Jesus with a characterization. He's not really talking about any specific scribe. He's talking about some behavior of the scribes. And he's talking about politician-y, uh, salesman-y, um, uh, people who can have themselves put together really well, uh, but are really f uh, um, wolf in sheep, sheep's clothing to steal language from Matthew. Uh, you know, and, and so what, what happens when we make generalizations is we can fall prey to people. Uh, when we make generalizations about people, uh, they can, we can take it, we can be taken advantage of because the person doesn't fit that. They can play that character with us, get us to do something that we would do, and then sort of walk away and really we haven't interacted with the real thing. So uh, this, is, this is some stuff here. Uh, it has to do with uh, thorny soil. The, the, the way the scribe is being talked about, and you would only know this by the compounding mark, deja vu, dead horse thing. Uh, what, what Jesus is really saying is uh, some, of the, some of the seed fell on thorny soil. And, and he's showing you what a thorny soil would look like. One of the scribes just a few verses ago, Jesus said, you're close to the kingdom of God. So this isn't meant to teach us about generalizing, and, and, and you and I should not be people that do that. Um, but this is meant to say, uh, you know, there's different kinds of soil, which kind are am I? Which kind are you? And, and so it's talking about uh, sort of how easy it is to put on a good face and, uh, and, and, and act like you, you're great because you voted this week, but then not take care of the people that you're making such a big deal. Like, like for example, hey, for example, I'm, I'm big on the abortion issue. For example, that's a, a generalization. Someone's big on the abortion issue. They vote that way, and that's the way they should, that they should do that. But then, you know, hey, whew, our person won. So, uh, you know, abortion will be right. Let's not, you know, I think, I think it's also then a call to, if that's an issue for you, participate in the care of people who are in a situation like that or children who are in a situation like that. Uh, if sexuality things are an issue for you and you vote that way, you're also being asked then to participate, to care. Uh, you know, the vote is part of the relationship, but it is nowhere near all of it. And so that's what Jesus is sort of laying out here with this generalization. Uh, and he's, he's saying, you know, here's this thorn person and then, and then he's showing the, the challenge of why you don't want to be a thorn. Because here's a, the widow who's good soil, who has heard God's word, who, who's all in on it, who, who has been consumed with, with, with the love of being loved, and has been consumed by God's Holy Spirit to the point where everything she has uh, belongs now to God, and, and she's participating, and, and people can't the, the the scribes in this story can't see the beauty of a loved person loving instead what they are they're people who deal in sort of the laws of of who owns a widow's land and there's a lot of stuff going on behind this text and so 
this has been, and this is the, the fifth thing there was the rehashing the thorns. Um, so I've talked, I said I was talking about six things. The parable of the sower, the rising action, the skipping of a few verses. The scribes were the fourth thing. Then rehashing that sort of generalization thorns thing was the fifth thing. The sixth thing is that this has been used as a stewardship text all the time. Like this is what you're supposed to look like when you're all in, when you're good soil. And that's true. And, and, and that is not a wrong take here, but it's not a complex take. Uh, that's not a, ta a take that honors the full context of the story. To, to, to make this about stewardship is to lift just the verses about the widow out and, and make it important. And, and that's not wrong, but it doesn't tell the full story. Really what this is to me is the story, and here's, this is the hang your hat. I mean, I've done the broken record, deja vu, dead horse, background now for 20 plus minutes. Here's the thing that finally be like, thank goodness you finally told us something that we can hear. This is a story about hope in the face of disaster. It's the story of what a person who has been loved looks like even when the thorns are all around them. So the widow is good soil. The thorns, the antagonism, the politics of this made up of, of these scribes who look beautiful and are so enticing do not tempt her. She does not fall into the trap. She would rather stare down the beast and give her two last cents than fall into the trap of worrying about uh, why they why they get to be dressed so good well or whatever she's focused on who God has called her to be and that is more important to her than the antagonism the, the scribes have let themselves be defined by what they're against by their antagonism by their splitting hairs by their uh, dead horse beating techniques the widow is defined by who God makes her so good soil is is defined by who God makes me and makes you, not by the things that circle around us, not the characters, not the stuff. We live in the midst of that, but we never stop, even if it's just a penny, prayerfully doing what we can with that penny. It's like staring down the barrel of the gun here. And so the widow is being lifted up as this small, vulnerable, uh, um, person who, who in and of themselves is, is in Jesus' time and world kind of outsider, not worth much, but who refuses, the power here is that she refuses to be sucked into the, the, um, the, the rising action. She refuses to be, she refuses to let the thorns, the thorniness of the thorns, uh, trap her. And that is the powerful, powerful word of today's gospel. Uh, it's not that we don't live in divisive times. It's not that we don't live in complicated post-election world. And it's not, hey, escape that. Yes, we live in that. But it is the refusal to be defined by anything other than how wonderful, how loving, how graceful Jesus is. That refusal to be defined by how many you know angels can dance on the head of a needle and, and to insist on only being defined by by the good soil that God has made her. That is the thesis here. That is the story and that is the same angle the sermon's gonna take. You only see that. This is a broken record and I'll wrap up with this. This is a broken record for preparing for Sunday. You only see what the text is doing when you participate in preparing for Sundays, when you see the story over and over, when you see how it's unfolding. Only then can you really understand what's happening here. What's happening here is a widow who has been claimed by God, who refuses to be about anything other than God. So that is a powerful, powerful message. Uh, you know, like again, I'll, I'll beat this dead horse. Uh, we live in this time where abortions become a huge civic issue. We have opinions on that. We have ways that we vote on that. To be defined by God in that would say, yes, we vote. Yes, we have an opinion. Yes, we have, we're choice, we're life. We, we're, we're choice and we're life after the election too. And to be choice in life after the election, if this is your issue, 
It means that you're God's person. You're the Holy Spirit bearer to find the people who are actually in that story. Not the people talking about it. Not the people making the rules and scribing about it. The people that are affected by it and caring for them and entering into loving because you've been loved. Refusing to worry about the commercials on TV and insisting on worrying about women who have circumstances around their pregnancy or, or whatever the story is. That's choice. That's love. This is what it means to be defined as a Lutheran instead of a Republican or Democrat. What I mean is, is I'm saying I'm defined by who God makes me more than I'm defined by who the parties want to tell me I am. And that is salvation. That is being queen. I cannot be the widow. I'm not a woman, I'm not a widow, and I have way more than two pennies. Uh, so I can't be her, but I can 100% be inspired by her and pray every day to God to help me be like her. And that there is so much the thrust of this text and you can tell I'm excited about it because this story just builds and builds and it's worth the time you put into it, all right? So what is deja vu? It's talking about deja vu for the 100th time. I know I'm a broken record. I know I'm a dead horse, uh, be a dead horse beater, but I am so glad that you tune into these because the payoff of God's voice, I think, is worth it. Thank you for joining me. I love this sort of way of getting through the story together. I hope that you stay safe. I hope that you live into the world post-election uh, without fear, with confidence of who God makes you. And I hope you uh, stay safe in all that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you soon.